are now. There we go. We are now recording. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Ken Rosenthal, and I'm a park naturalist at Gulf Branch Nature Center. Um, this is a, a deep dive on symbiosis. I've been doing these for about three years. Uh, so to some of you uh, that are new, that haven't done this before, welcome. Glad to have you. Uh, and for those of you who are coming back, welcome back. Um, I just want to remind you that this is essentially a, uh, a meeting. So if you could be sure to keep your microphones off. Um, if I start to get choppy or break up, your uh, best bet is to shut off your video. Uh, shutting off your video, make sure that um, uh, the bandwidth isn't used over overly much and that should hopefully prevent any video issues or sound issues with me um, uh, for what you're watching. So I am gonna go ahead and uh, uh, get started with my presentation now. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing. Um, Madeline Koenig is the other, Maddie, sorry, is the uh, uh, other park naturalist here. And I say other as if I'm the first one, but uh, we're both the park naturalists here at Gulf Branch Nature Center. She's gonna moderate for me. So um, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat um, or you can raise your hand. There is a raise your hand feature. Some of you that are on, I think cell phones may not see the raise your hand feature, but hopefully you can get into the chat. Um, I'll have a point at the end as well where I'll ask for questions and if you want to unmute and ask that's fine as well. Um, but Maddie's going to try to interrupt me uh, when there are any questions so that we can make sure we're answering questions uh, in the best amount of time. So I'm actually going to shut uh, this box here so I'm not distracted by who's in the meeting uh, and I'm going to get started. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my, uh, my desktop with you uh, and we're going to get started with the PowerPoint presentation. Um, Let's start with the PowerPoint presentation. Here we go. All right. So tonight we're going to talk about symbiosis. This is, um, to me, one of the most important things that you can understand when it comes to ecology and nature because um, the critters that are out there, the plants that are out there, the organisms that are out there, they do not live in silos. They all interact. They all come in contact with each other. Whether they mean to or not, their actions still affect each other. Um, I think it's a great life lesson for, for people in general, but it's certainly a great lesson for understanding uh, the intricacies of nature and understanding that you can't just remove one species, alter one species, change how one species does something without affecting um, the species that depend on that species, but also the ecosystem as well. Um, this is a lichen, and you'll see uh, in a second why this is my, my opening slide, but lichens are kind of the reason we have the word symbiosis. Um, so um, I like my definitions. Sometimes I have a lot, sometimes I don't have any. This is going to have a lot of big words for you to wow your friends with later. Um, a symbiosis is an interaction between individuals of different species. Um, it can be beneficial, it cannot be beneficial. There's six main ones we'll go over. Um, uh, and I'm going to start with that here, but this is a root nodule from an alder, uh, and these root in these root nodules are nitrogen fixing bacteria. So they're very important to the survival of this this species because they fix uh, nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, so that the tree can actually use it. Um, if I remember correctly, the proportion of our atmosphere is like 79% of it's nitrogen, but it's all atmospheric nitrogen. It is not something that is biologically available. And so in order to use that, it needs to be fixed. Uh, so there are many species that do that. This is one. Uh, and a lot of these, a lot of these plant species ha that um, have the ability to do this are um, plant species that have uh, an association with some kind of bacteria that does that. Um, and we'll come back to that. I have a lot more to say about nitrogen, but not at this point. So, all right. There we go. Um, so we're going to come back to lichen. This is a ruffled lichen. Uh, and lichens are uh, a close association between an algae uh, and a uh, fungus. And here's a nice diagram I found. These, hopefully you can see my, my cursor arrow. These blue uh, uh, squiggly lines here all around, these are hyphae. These are the, the structural part of, of a fungus. Okay, if you've ever uh, rolled a log and found all these black um, stringy looking things, those are the hyphae of um, uh, fungi. So when we see, when you see something like a, a mushroom, that's the fruiting body, but it's not necessarily the entire um, part of the fungus. So this is the fungus. And you can see here, these green circles are the algae. So these green circles are a green algae that is living within the fungus. And so 
Uh, this is a lichen. You've got the green algae that produce uh, simple sugars through photosynthesis. So they produce food that they use to nurse themselves and then is also passed on to the fungus. The fungus provides structure for the algae. So you've got algae making food, you've got the structure, the fungus providing uh, protection, um, and both organisms benefit from this association. There are um, some lichens where, I wanna, if I remember correctly, the fungus can live without the algae, um, but I don't know that there's any algae that can live without the fungus, um, but it's pretty rare. A lot of times they're very much dependent on each other and you won't have one without the other. Um, this is the wordiest I'm going to get on one of my slides. Um, the, the term first showed up in 1877 was coined by uh, Albert Bernard Frank, uh, who was a German uh, mycologist, uh, and he termed it specifically to talk about the relationship between the algae and the fungus in, in lichens. And in 1878, uh, another German mycologist, uh, DeBerry, defined it as uh, the living together of unlike organisms. Thus began essentially uh, a century of arguing over how we should use this term. Um, I always like to point out that uh, scientists really like to argue about words. They like specific words that are very, very um, targeted, like having a specific name for your ring finger fingernail. Uh, I don't know if there's actually that, but it's something very similar. They will they will name every part on an animal and it's very specific or every part on a plant or every part on an organism. So um, from 1878 until almost the 1970s, um, there was an argument over what the word symbiosis means because for many people they wanted to just mean um, a, a uh, sorry right, this word right here mutualism which is one of the types of interactions we'll talk about um, wherein both species benefit and um, there are others that argued that uh, symbiosis should mean any relationship between organisms even if it's detrimental to one or both organisms uh, so ultimately that's what we're going to talk about is there's six different relation types and in some there's a benefit and some there's a negative and some there's a negative to both uh, both species that are uh, interacting with each other. Um, in 1949, Eddie Haskell, and this is not the uh, neighbor from Leave it to Beaver, but Edward Haskell was an interesting uh, guy, he probably worth a, a topic on his own, but he proposed um, co-actions, which is later changed to interactions, and that's what we'll talk about is these uh, six different interaction types. Um, an interaction such as predation is not considered uh, a symbiotic relationship because it, a uh, preda uh, predation, uh, a predator prey interaction is too quick uh, and it's sometimes fatal, sometimes not, um, but it's not a, a long term relationship, which is what symbiosis is really referring to. So, um, and two more words that I, that I hope to work in at some point um, uh, while I'm talking today, but they can be pretty important. Uh, one is obligate, uh, and that means that you have to have a certain condition in order to survive. So if that condition is not met, um, you cannot survive or you cannot survive in that particular location. In this case, um, the example I'm using for both obligate and its, and its, um, uh, its, its uh, opposite is uh, ana uh, living in anaerobic conditions. So this is Clostridium, which brought us such great things as tetanus and botulism. And uh, Clostridium is an obligate anaerobe. It has to grow in anaerobic conditions. <clears throat> anaerobic conditions are oxygenless conditions. So if there's any oxygen, especially atmospheric oxygen, oxygen that we're used to, uh, that organism cannot grow. Okay. So obviously the opposite of that is something that could grow in anaerobic or um, aerobic conditions. Uh, so that would be uh, facultative. They, they can grow in maybe two different conditions, they're not restricted to one. Uh, this is Escherichia coli, E. coli, uh, which I'm sure we've heard all about uh, in different news stories. It's a common uh, bacterium that lives in our gut. Uh, it's generally considered very helpful. Obviously, there are some strains of it which, if ingested, can cause some serious uh, illness, um, but it is a facultative anaerobe. It can live in anaerobic conditions. It does not require anaerobic conditions to survive. So uh, I'm going to go with my first my first example here before we uh, get into the, the six different interactions. Uh, these are May apples. Uh, I love May apples. They come out early spring. They got these umbrella like uh, leaves. They're very easy to spot and you usually find them in these small colonies. They're all bunched together. And if you look under May apples where you can find the ones that have uh, two, stock, two stems or stalks like this, you'll find this flower in the middle and eventually uh, this flower, which you, you'll see in April, uh, in mid to late May or maybe early June, um, 
produces a fruit, the May apple, as it's called. Um, and if you'll notice, these guys are really close to the ground. So this is a really easy fruit to reach for any critters that live on the ground, like say, because of course I have a specific example, uh, the eastern box turtle. Eastern box turtles can reach those fruits. The fruits have an uh, aroma, a really good smell to them that attracts the box turtle in. Uh, so the box turtle eats the fruit um, and obviously it takes time for this to process. So by the time the box turtle has consumed the fruit, uh, it's gone through the digestive process in its body. The box turtle is ready to get rid of um, its waste products, ready to, to defecate. Um, it is probably somewhere um, different from where it ate the initial May apple. And so what you'll find is um, that these box turtles can um, transfer or disperse May apple seeds. Now, May apple does not have to go through a box turtle's gut in order to germinate and be successful in growing, but it helps. Um, I think a, there was a study where they found that um, May apples that go through a box turtle's gut uh, are, and are dispersed somewhere else, a 40% better chance of germinating and being successful uh, than not. Um, but my favorite thing to tell kids is when you find a May apple patch like that, you can you know, have a pretty good chance of pointing to go box turtle poop there once because that's how um, May apples, that's one way of, of May apples getting dispersed. Uh, and I always find that fascinating that one of those little stories that you can um, enjoy while you're out taking a walk in the woods. So the box turtle benefits by getting a meal out of it. Obviously the seeds are indigestible, but the uh, the fleshy part of the fruit is and the box turtle gets nutrition. And the May apple benefits because it went through all the energy of producing a fruit, which was eaten by an animal, but the reproductive seeds inside the fruit were not uh, consumed and are spread somewhere else. And so uh, the May apple has a better chance of passing off its genetics to its offspring. Uh, this is called mutualism. Um, and again, I think part of this has to do with the origin of the word symbiosis, but a lot of times when you talk about symbiotic relationships, people go right to mutualism, where both organisms benefit and everybody's happy. Um, and there are people who argue that there's no true altruism in um, nature and that both organisms are getting something out of it, and so that's what it's really about. Um, and I'm not really interested in going in that philosoph philosophical debate out there. I'll make you aware of it. Um, but it is true. Both of these organisms are going to get a benefit out of this relationship. Um, I think one of the classic ones, which is why I put it here, is, is clownfish and anemones. Clownfish help to clean the anemones, keep them free of parasites. Anemones provide a, um, a structure or shelter for the clownfish that most predators are not going to go after because um, it's, a, it's a stinging uh, organism and that would, be, that would be quite painful for the predator to try to go in and get the clownfish. Um, some more local examples. Um, well, this isn't a local example, but I'll, I'll get to local examples. This is a uh, prairie trillium, and these are the fruits. And you can see these little seeds here at the bottom. We'll put on here. Each one of these is a seed. The brown part is the actual seed. This fleshy white part here is something called an eliasome. And eliasomes are, um, if I remember correctly, I think they're full of lipids. They're very attractive to ants. Um, and many, many different plants use uh, eliasomes. In fact, if you do a nice search online to look up eliasomes, um, you can find some really beautiful pictures of some really intricate shapes. But essentially, you're going to find what almost looks like a mohawk, or obviously, in this case, just this, this fleshy nub on the end of the seed. Um, but this is the, the eliasome. This tastes really good. So the ants pick this seed up. Uh, and you can see here's a different shape one here. Uh, different ant, different seed, different ant, different seed. If the ants take the seed back to their uh, colony. There they uh, gnaw off the elizome, they eat it, they store it however they use it for. And then they take the seed and put the seed in their discard pile. The, the discard pile is still part of the colony, it's still inside the colony. So that discard pile is protected from other animals that would eat these seeds. So not only do you um, you have the seed dispersed, it's moved from being essentially maybe right under the parent uh, plant, but now it's in a different area and it's protected because there's not a lot of uh, animals that are going to go and raid uh, an ant colony looking for food, certainly not for an easy meal. So your seed has now been moved and it's now in a place where it's got a better chance of germinating. And oh, by the way, it's in the discard pile where there's a, a good chance that there's a, a higher than normal um, amount of nutrients in that soil. So uh, this 
uh, is a strategy that works out really well. Obviously, the plant gets the dispersal. Uh, the ants get a, a little bit of food out of it, and then the plant also gets the um, subsequent protection of its young plant growing up. Uh, I believe, I was trying to avoid it, but I'll, I'll go for it. I believe it's Myrmecori, Myrmecori, Myrmecori uh, is how you pronounce it. Um, and again, this happens around here. The uh, plant on the left here is bloodroot. Uh, plant in the middle is a spring beauty, and the, on the right we have Dutchman's breeches. These are all plants that use Myrmecacori to disperse their seeds. Uh, interestingly, they're all also spring ephemerals. Uh, they bloom quick, or they grow quick, uh, bloom, and, and get pollinated before the tree canopy grows in in spring. Uh, so they're essentially in a race against time to um, grow, bloom, get pollinated, uh, and then uh, produce fruit. Um, before the uh, the leaves of the trees move in and, and cover it all up. Um, and these are all species you can find here in Arlington and Northern Virginia. Um, the first, I feel like the first symbiotic relationship I really learned about was the crocodile and the plover. And the crocodiles would sit on the river and they open their mouth and the plover would do, 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 trot in and pick out food or leeches or little bugs or whatever was in that crocodile's teeth and keep the crocodile's teeth nice and clean. And the plover had nothing to worry about because the crocodile knew that the bird was there to clean its teeth. And so they both benefited because the plover had a safe place to get some food and nobody was going to mess with the plover while it was in the crocodile's mouth. And the crocodile ends up with a clean mouth. And what I learned today of all days is probably not. Uh, it was first described by Herodotus. And since then, there have been maybe one or two people. Like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I saw that bird. It was like a sandpiper or a plover or something. And it went into the crocodile's mouth. Um, there's no photographic evidence of this ever happening. Um, and aside from a few observations, it's thought that this is probably highly unlikely to happen uh, and not a, a regular occurrence at all, which is a bummer. Because again, I remember learning this very young age and, and thinking this is really fantastic. Um, but that doesn't mean the cleaning, cleaning symbiosis doesn't occur. Uh, this is an ox pecker, and they use a scissor-like uh, motion to work through the fur of a, of a large mammal, uh, usually a large hoof mammal. Um, while they're on the large mammal, obviously they've got uh, a little bit of safety. Uh, they're they're elevated so they can watch for predators. If the mammal responds to a predator, they're certainly going to take off, so that helps. Uh, what's interesting is, I don't know how mutualistic this is because apparently they will also pick at sores and scabs and will sample the animal's blood. And that blood of these hoofed animals can be a significant portion of their uh, food. So that's interesting because again, if they're picking off uh, parasites that are out there, they're also gorging on the blood. They're getting that blood in their diet as well. Uh, so I thought this was really interesting. Um, marine organisms have a really um, uh, a really large collection. There's a large collection of marine organisms that um, depend on this cleaning symbiosis. Uh, this is a moray eel, uh, and that is literally a fish in its jaw. And that fish doesn't have a lot to worry about because it's a cleaner wrasse. Um, and they'll actually, there's, I think, quote, locations or cleaning stations where fish can show up. Um, I don't know if the mores do that because obviously they have a pretty specific area they live, uh, whether the wrasse comes to them. Um, but there are cleaning stations where fish will show up in order to um, be cleaned by these cleaner wrasse. And the cleaner wrasse has a coloration, excuse me, um, very similar. Like if you think of wasps and bees and hornets, they have a very specific coloration. And it says, hey, don't touch me or I'm going to sting you. And there are animals that imitate that. Well, there are uh, there are some very similar colorations between these and um, I believe the other group is gobies that do this uh, cleaning uh, and they have um, similar colors and they also have certain behavioral postures that they will take to encourage this animal to open its mouth and then they go into the mouth and they clean out um, the mouth of I believe it's parasites and little food bits uh, and that's a healthier mouth for the eel and a little meal for the wrasse and again um, you know, here we have photographic evidence. So obviously, this happens, and it happens. It's documented in many different um, different uh, relationships between different uh, marine species. Um, so I, I think it's just fabulous. I can't imagine swimming into the mouth of something bigger that could eat me uh, to clean out its teeth, and knowing it's not going to do it. Um, and again, there are um, lots of mutualistic interactions where this happens, where um, there's some kind of chemical cue, or there's some kind of 
uh, visual cue or there's some kind of behavioral cue that lets the bigger, more dangerous animal know that this animal is, um, I'm trying to think of the proper term, this animal is going to do something that's going to help me and it would be in my best interest not to feed on that animal. Um, so yeah, and, and again, like I said, mutualism is the one that most people go to. So I want to make sure I've got time to uh, hit the other ones. And I was surprised this is, I could do a whole series just on this one topic. Um, it, it's a fascinating topic. So uh, commensalism, if you, sometimes you'll see a chart with um, all these different interactions and they have pluses and minuses and zeros. Plus means it's a positive result for that species. Minus means it's a negative result and zero means it, there's no there's no difference. It neither uh, hurts nor helps that organism. Uh, in commensalism, you have a relationship in one species benefits while the other is not significantly affected. It doesn't get hurt, it doesn't get helped, it just doesn't really get uh, any kind of really um, negative or positive interaction out of it. So uh, this guy here is a cattle egret, and cattle egret off obviously are associated with cattle. But unlike the oxpecker, which would have, you know, or some of these other birds which will land on, uh, which will land on large mammals uh, in order to feed off of parasites that are in their fur or on their body, uh, cattle egrets will hang out with um, horses or um, cattle and as the horses and the cattle move through the fields, they will follow and chase after the insects that are disturbed. So you get these big mammals moving through, and obviously, you know, if you've ever walked through the grass and you've seen a bunch of the little leaf hoppers and plant hoppers and moths flee before you as if you're a Godzilla, um, these cattle yurts are depending on that. So they're hanging out with these large mammals, and as these large mammals move through these areas uh, full of grass, they are plucking up the insects and the other small critters that run to get away from the big mammals. And of course, the horses aren't going to eat any of those bugs unless they happen to be on the leaf that they're munching on. But that is a, um, a really important behavioral adaptation for these birds to benefit from food. And the bird's presence doesn't affect the, the horses or the, or the cattle in any way. Um, this, is, this is an interesting one. I, I've always enjoyed the role that beavers can play in an ecosystem. I think most people recognize it. Um, property holder, property owners notwithstanding, you know, having a beaver can be really exciting because they will um, come into an area, they will essentially build their own pond that they can, that they can live in. They're raising that water level to their comfort level, um, typically, unless they're living in a river where they got a bank because the river's really deep. But if they, you know, build a, a dam to raise the water level up, they've just created a very significant water source year round for other critters. And so you got animals coming in to take advantage of the water, you got animals who live in water coming in because it's a good habitat for them. And then you got the animals that eat all those other animals showing up because this is where the food is now. Um, this really doesn't affect the beaver. In many ways, a beaver is a commensal species where it creates something that's important for it. Um, all these other animals benefit, but the beaver doesn't get any benefit. Beaver still got to do all the work, if anything, you know. Um, and prairie dogs are very much the same way. Prairie dogs build these big communities. Uh, these are sometimes, uh, most of these are called um, keystone species. Get that to pop up. Um, and, and as I said, um, whoop. there we go. And as I said, um, just like with the argu uh, argument over symbiosis and what it means and what it should mean, there are um, a lot of scientists who feel that keystone species, that term is sometimes overused uh, or has lost some meaning. Um, but I, I think it's fairly valid with these two because, again, if you don't have that beaver, or if you don't have that prairie dog, it can change that habitat or it can, the habitat may not be as um, good to have or as um, I'm trying to think of a word, as biodiverse as it could be. There's over 150 some species of plants and animals that are positively influenced by the presence of prairie dogs. This is really amazing how much they can do. I, I haven't seen a study like that on the Eastern Be on the American beaver, but I'm sure there's there's uh, similar numbers. Uh, for example, this is a beaver lodge right here. Um, and here's a mallard duck taking advantage of that aquatic uh, ecosystem. I, I just chose two birds at random. There are, like I said, literally there are probably hundreds of species that um, you could find for each one. Uh, this guy on the right is a burrowing owl. Again, they will use um, abandoned prairie dog holes uh, as a, a place to raise their young, uh, hence the name burrowing owl. I'm pretty sure they don't do their own burrowing. Uh, maybe they clean it out a little bit. Um, 
And I don't think they um, actually prey on the prairie dog. They just use that space when the prairie dogs have moved out or somebody else uh, has preyed on the prairie dogs. Um, this one, this is pretty neat. This is called foresy, I think is the right term. P-H-O-R-E-S-Y. So here's a fly. And this little patch right here in the back of the abdomen, there's a bunch of mites. Uh, and they are freeloaders. They didn't pay. They didn't call Uber. They don't provide anything nice for that fly. Um, but apparently they don't really hinder the fly either. So these mites have attached to this fly and the fly will fly somewhere else and the, mats, the mites might detach if they like that spot and they've dispersed to a new area. Um, and I thought this was amazing. And then I saw this photo, uh, which is another kind of fly. Um, this is from Europe, but we do have these pseudoscorpions. So I'm sure we find this around here as well. But this is a pseudoscorpion. Uh, you can see the, the little front appendage here with the pincher and he has a pretty good grip on this fly's leg and he will hang on that fly till it lands somewhere that the pseudoscorpion fly is acceptable and then he will um, detach and drop off and uh, move on with his life. Um, and I, again, whoops, I just think this is fantastic. I found several pictures like this, uh, but this is the best one that I, you know, that showed the pseudoscorpion, um, but it's certainly an interesting um, interaction. And again, it is really temporary. So I, mean, I know I made a big stink earlier about predation not being, a symbiotic relationship because it's so temporary. Um, but I think these interactions, even though they're small, excuse me, uh, these guys do make, um, do do this frequently and that's why it is considered a uh, symbiotic interaction. And, and nothing happens to, so we can tell the, the fly is not hurt by um, the grip of the pseudoscorpion. It's not hindered in any way from flying, which is interesting because that's a pretty big, pretty big uh, uh, passenger to be hanging on there but there's no real effect to the fly, but it does help, certainly help the pseudoscorpion move on. Um, commensalism. Oh, sorry. So um, this is a, a different form of commensalism. Okay, we're still talking about one uh, species benefiting while the other species has no benefit or, um, or hurt from it. Um, inquilinism. So an inquiline, um, in, in this case is this, um, larva of a mosquito, um, the inquiline lives in or on the host. Um, in this case, this guy is uh, fairly common uh, up and down the East Coast and, and common across most of Canada. And the place where this mosquito lives uh, is in this purple pitcher plant. Um, so the pitcher plant uh, liquids gather in there. Uh, if you know, if you're familiar with pitcher plants, or if you're not familiar with pitcher plants, excuse me, what happens is uh, an insect will go in, maybe it smells good, the insect goes in, or it's attracted by um, the opening and, and the light that's shining through it. Uh, they often have um, uh, walls here that allow some light. So when it's, the insect goes into the pitcher plants, the main part of its body here, there is a, um, there's light that shines through, it's kind of translucent, and it can confuse the insect, and the insect gets tired, if it doesn't go into the liquid right away and eventually falls into, um, uh, there's a, a, a pool of liquid here inside the pitcher plant uh, and eventually it's digested. So this is actually an insectivorous plant, uh, even though obviously it doesn't actively um, grab the insects. What's neat is uh, this mosquito will lay its egg inside the pitcher plant. The um, larva for whatever reason aren't digested um, in there and maybe maybe it's because they're free swimming because they're they're choosing to live there um but what's neat is this guy here you can see it's magnified it's obviously very tiny especially if it's a, the larva of a mosquito which are already pretty small um this mosquito larvae is actually the big top predator inside the water inside that pitcher plant um you'll have a lot of small microorganisms that are living in there and this guy eats them all um the nice thing about this mosquito is there's not a lot of evidence that they actually bite us so it can be a pretty common uh, mosquito if you find around these pitcher plants. And these pitcher plants often live in areas that are uh, like bogs, which are actually can be very nutrient poor in the soil, which is why they supplement their um, their nutrient intake by uh, essentially catching insects and, and digesting them. Uh, and so this mosquito is living inside there um, and, and making a pretty good living apparently, eating a lot of these other critters that are also in there as well. Uh, and this is my favorite one. Uh, this is fantastic. Um, there's some species of moths, and this one in particular I'm talking about. Um, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to try to name it. I think it's Cryptopeps 
Colepsy or Colepi, uh, but I don't want to be quoted on that. And uh, this moth, the adults live in the fur of the sloth. And what happens is the females, uh, sloths don't poop just willy nilly from wherever they're in the trees. Uh, leaving a trail of feces across the forest floor would be a good way for a large animal to follow you through the through the uh, the jungle. So what the sloth will do is every I think it's I can't remember if it's like three or seven days, you know, but several days it will back its way down a tree and defecate at the base of the tree and then scoot right back up and that's it. Well, what happens is this moth takes the journey down the tree with the uh, sloth and lays its eggs in the feces of the sloth. The larvae that hatch are coprophages. That's a fancy word for eating poop. Uh, the larvae are coprophages. They eat the um, sloth droppings until they they reach their fill so they can pupate, uh, and then they emerge from pupating as adults and spread uh, throughout the forest and, and essentially um, find another uh, sloth and repeat the process. These moths live directly in. You can see that's what I think what they're trying to show you in this. Um, possibly what they're trying to show in this diagram, is this moth lives directly in uh, the fur of the sloth, so they do not, but they do not harm the sloth. They don't eat the sloth. Uh, obviously, they're not going to slow the sloth down. Uh, it would be kind of silly if they did. Um, and so they're essentially living on the sloth without uh, any effect, positive or negative sloth. Uh, but it's it's a huge help for these guys, because as long as the sloth doesn't get eaten, it's a safe place. Uh, and then they're using the, uh, the drop-in from the sloth uh, as food for their young. So next time you think about the food you had growing up, uh, maybe you give your parents a little break because it wasn't sloth poop. Um, parasitism. I didn't want to go. This is to me this fascinating. In fact, I'm doing another deep dive in three weeks and I'll be on this one because I really want to hit this one uh, really good. But I want to touch base in case you're not going to be here in three weeks or um, for whatever reason. Um, uh, but in parasitism, this one, if you're looking at the symbols, there's a plus and there's a negative. The plus is the parasite which gets a meal of some kind from the host. Uh, the host is a negative because it's losing nutrients. Uh, and there could also be other um, um, negatives. Besides physical damage, you can also get a disease. Uh, it can weaken you. There's a, there's a lot of, of downsides, obviously, to uh, having a parasite, uh, being the host for a parasite. Um, there are, they kind of lump it in two kinds. It's essentially the approach that the parasite takes. Uh, is the parasite living on you? That's ecto, meaning out, or ectoparasitism. In this case, we've got a, uh, here's a Asian tiger mosquito on my leg. Um, and <laughs> instead of swatting it, I took a picture. Um, but uh, ectoparasitism, where in the uh, parasites on the outside of the organism that it's um, getting its sustenance from versus endoparasitism, which is when the parasite's actually on the inside of the host. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Anybody who's paranoid about cooking, fully cooking any kind of food uh, is aware on some level of endoparasitism. Hey, speaking of which, uh, there is the head of tapeworm, uh, which is um, obviously an, an internal or endoparasite. Um, and I couldn't resist this picture. This is a human head louse, uh, which is pretty much a, has a cosmopolitan distribution because there are people all around the world. You can see it is you know, very well adapted for hiding on its host body. You can see those all those hooks at the end of the legs there for hiding in among the hair there. I hope nobody's itching right now. Um, I do want to make one distinction um, before I move on from parasites. Like I said, I'm going to do a whole uh, session of this in a couple weeks. Uh, parasitoids is another phrase. These are not parasites. Parasites, parasites generally do not kill their host. They might weaken it, they could kill it by weakening it indirectly, but they don't kill it themselves. They're not um, trying to essentially um, eat and eat and eat until they lose their host. Parasitoids, on the other hand, do eventually kill their host. This is uh, one of the tussock moths, and these are preconid wasp uh, cocoons on it. The um, wasp stings a caterpillar, and when it stings with its ovipositor, it's injecting eggs inside the body of the caterpillar. The eggs hatch, the larvae eat the soft tissue inside the caterpillar, but leave the uh, the major organs alone as much as possible. Um, eventually, the caterpillar just stops moving because it doesn't have the ability to anymore. Um, and by, but by then, they have the larvae have eaten enough that they are ready to uh, essentially um, come out of the exoskeleton of the caterpillar, even though they're, they're not, you know, an adult 
moth or butterfly yet. They still do have an exoskeleton and the um, the larva of the uh, wasps burrow out of the exoskeleton and form these cocoons on the exterior of the caterpillar. Uh, just to make sure you can see these are cocoons. You can see some of them are open, uh, meaning the wasps have already left. Um, and eventually this does kill the caterpillar. They do not survive this interaction. So being a parasitoid uh, is, is thought in evolutionary terms to be the step from uh, parasitism to pre predation uh, because they do eventually kill their host. They don't keep them alive. Um, they have a, a much more significant, obviously, and fatal impact on their host. Um, amensalism. This is an interesting one. Um, now this is a, uh, a zero to plus, a zero and a minus. There's an organism that's affecting another organism. The organism that affects the second organism does not have, does not get any benefit and obviously does not have any harm from the interaction, but it is directly harming another organism. I've always thought of this, uh, correctly or not, but what the thing that, the first thing that's always popped into my head on this is um, walking in the grass or taking a walk through weeds, you know, or if you've ever stepped on plants and, you know, you heard them snap and, and, and break, uh, or they have a tough time bending back up because you, you know, you bent them or broke them while you're stepping on them. It doesn't hurt you, it doesn't help you unless it's your garden, you know, or unless it's your, you know, you were trying to plant those plants. But if you're just walking through a grassy field, you're stepping on all those plants and you're probably damaging some of them. And that's, uh, to me, an immense relationship. This is, uh, in this picture, we've actually got a black walnut and they produce uh, a chemical that inhibits the growth of other uh, plants around them. Oh, I can't remember the name of the chemical, but it's 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 um, uh, pretty significant thing. I think this can also be called allelopathy. Um, um, this was directly when I, the source I was looking at was directly called this antagonism. Uh, but this is again really really important. It doesn't really help the the walnut. Honestly, although I think one could argue that if there's no plants or other things in here with roots, you're not fighting anybody for water. Um, but this is considered immensalism. Uh, to me, what's a better example? This is a Spanish ibex, um, and a Spanish ibex really, really likes uh, a certain kind of shrub that it eats uh, quite a bit of. There's also a weevil, and the weevil also likes to eat said shrub. Uh, the problem is the weevil is small and he is not going to stop that ibex from eating it while the ibex is gra uh, grazing on the shrub. So you got this ibex that's just chomping away on the shrub and it's going to ingest some of these uh, weevils. The ibex doesn't get sick, doesn't get hurt. Um, I don't know that anybody's done a, a full documentation on whether there is a protein increase and whether it helps or not, but essentially the ibex is getting what it needs from the plant. It happens to be eating the uh, the weevil. So for these two, this is very much an immense relationship in that the weevil gets killed uh, while the ibex gets food and could care less whether there's weevils on its plants or not. Um, so it's that kind of thing. It, it, this one's a, a little bit tougher. Like I said, you know, when you talk about symbiosis, everybody gravitates towards both organisms helping each other. And some of these, some of these other ones can be a little tougher. Wait till I get to the last one. Um, hey, Ken, real quick. Um, yeah. We've got a quick question. Nick is asking if um, a good example would be like creosite bush in the southwest. That's not one I've ever heard of. I've and heard of know, Nick, if you, Nick, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask your own question worded a little better than I can. <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I've heard that the creosote bush does the same kind of thing as a black walnut. Okay. Putting out stuff so that nothing grows close to it. I don't know if that's true or not, but. So, yeah, and, 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 to, and it, I remember learning that as a, as a form of lulopathy, uh, and I always thought the benefit was that you're not competing with it, although I also know that some, uh, some plants can um, – have chemical waste products that get deposited in the soil that eventually make it impossible for them to continue growing in that soil and they um, actually make the soil inhospitable to them through their own allelopathy. Um, so if, if the, if the creosote is doing that, and I'm, I'm actually, I've heard of the name, I, I'm aware of it, but I'm not familiar with it. Um, that would be the same thing. Um, like I said, I feel like that one's kind of a tough, um, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, 
a tough example with the plants because I feel like there are some benefits to not having other plants growing right next to you. Um, whereas, you know, you have a lot of different animals that can graze on, that will graze on plants and they're probably eating other organisms uh, accidentally and not getting sick, but not getting any benefit from that, from ingesting that animal. But that animal, you know, is dying. And that to me is, is probably the best example of uh, an immense relationship. Uh, hope that answered your question. Um, I think competition is probably actually a really easy one for most people to understand. Uh, the key here is though, both, an, uh, both organisms are negatively affected because they're expending extra resources extra energy or resources to gain an environmental resource uh, because they're directly competing with somebody else. Uh, whether it's the, uh, it could be the same species, uh, members of the same species, which then uh, kind of goes against the original uh, definition of symbiosis, but it can certainly be with other species as well. Um, and there are, you know, some animals uh, who are very specific in what they eat and some animals that are very general in what they eat. And if a generalist is, is helping to eat um, a specialist diet that can affect the specialist much more than it would affect the generalist. Uh, but competition is not only about food. I, I got a picture of a lion and some hyenas here. And obviously, um, you know, when an animal catches food, especially a bigger animal, the other animals show up almost immediately like, hey, can we have some of that too? Hey, looks like you got too much to eat. And so there's, there's a whole uh, set of interactions there. Um, but it's not just just food. Competition can be for uh, space. This is microstigium, which is Japanese silk grass. Um, if you've walked a trail around here in the last five years or probably longer, you've probably seen this at some point. It's non-native, it's invasive. Um, it grows out early, grows out quickly, and you know essentially takes up the space for other, that other organisms can't grow in it because it's already using that space. Uh, and then you have the um, house sparrow here, and the house sparrows are um, pretty aggressive to other birds that are also cavity nesters. And so they can outcompete some of our, our, our local species for um, nesting space, uh, especially because they also don't leave. If you've got a migratory uh, cavity nester that shows up and all the, you know, most of the good cavities are already taken by house sparrows, that can be a big problem. Uh, and so competition can be a, a real big issue with, with invasive species, uh, which have an advantage. Maybe they don't have, uh, you know, native diseases here, native predators that can that can take advantage of them, and so they can really grow quickly and outcompete native species that also have other pressures, not just the pressure for this one particular resource. Um, and then you can have a mating competition. Uh, I hope everybody can see if you're looking really close. Here's a male, and here's a male, and here's a female. And I don't know which of these males got there first, but I'm sure they would tell you if they could speak. Um, but you'll have competition for mating, obviously through displays, but in this case, sometimes um, you know, much more direct in, in physical confrontation. And I think most people have probably seen um, some picture at some point of two male deer, you know, with their antlers locked, which I don't think happens very often, but there's certainly a, a sort of competition there. Uh, and there's a lot of energy displayed in uh, trying to find a mate. Um, a lot of these interactions between the species um, are very important in driving uh, evolution. Um, certainly competition is one that is directly talked about, you know, initially directly talked about um, in, in Darwin's On the Origin of Species when, when he laid out the, the theory initially, uh, not just competition for food, but also called competition for mates and some of the uh, really elaborate, um, even dangerous uh, body coverings that animals have in order to attract a mate. I mean, just think about our, you know, our northern cardinal, which is a very bright red and can be really easy to spot. Uh, and that's an advantage if you're trying to, you know, find a mate, but the rest of the year, that's kind of a disadvantage if you're trying to hide. It's a good thing they're small. Um, one of the things they found was these characters on these different finches can be changed. If you've got, say, you know, you've got three finches that are ground finches, um, you know, small, medium, and large bills, and, if the medium build finch is not one of the islands, what you find is a higher range of diff uh, of size difference between the meat, the small build ground finch and the large build ground finch. I don't know if I'm entirely saying the names right, um, but what they find is more variation in these the two finches on either end because of the medium ground finch was missing on that particular point. Where you wouldn't find if you found all three species on an island, you find a much more narrow range for those bills. Uh, because there was a lot of competition, so there wasn't a lot of overlap um, in uh, what they were feeding on. Uh, 
Um, so competition is, is a really important driving force uh, in evolution. And I threw this one in there because I've seen it listed a lot of times, but I, I, I've never seen an actual example. Wikipedia actually says there's not an example, which is, it's a Wikipedia, I get that. Um, but it's really hard. Neutralism is supposedly where uh, there's a relationship between two species that interact but do not affect each other. That doesn't sound like a relationship to me. Um, and I've racked my brain. I, I've done a, a general ecology for our master naturalist group for several years, and this is in there. Uh, and every year I try to think of another one, and I can't come up with anything. Because to me, if there's no interaction, if there's no interaction, there's no relationship. Because um, I can say I have the same interaction with uh, a red fox on the other side of the Potomac right now as I have with a polar bear up in the Arctic Circle. Um, there's there's no relationships there's, and there's no interaction. Um, this was, I, I think this is uh, kind of like... Um, uh, I want to say negative numbers or you know certain mathematical things where the numbers don't really exist but they use them uh, as proofs and as um as a way of expressing um certain mathematical ideas i feel like um this term is used in certain to certain ways like that in uh in ecosystem science and, and understanding but not necessarily something that you're going to actually find an example of uh, the gentleman that coined the phrase neutralism i think his last name was odom there's a school of ecology named after him uh, at the university of georgia and he was one of the first people to um really talk about using you know, studying the ecosystem as a whole um so he wasn't you know um, somebody didn't know what he's talking about. He's a very smart guy. Um, but this is one of those things that you're not going to find. I think it's very hard to find an example of. Uh, but it's 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 still part of that range of uh, interactions that one should understand when you talk about symbiosis. Oh, oh. click. So what? This is always a big question. Um, so I got a couple things here. Understanding these interactions is important if, if you're managing an area if you're if you're managing it certainly for a certain kind of wildlife you've got to know what they're interacting with how they're interacting with it and, and whether those are important um this is one of the reasons that you know in the last few decades um since the uh, you know since the endangered species act was enacted one of the things they moved away from was we're going to protect the alligator too we're going to protect this ecosystem that has the alligator because that's the way to protect the species and then you have a protection for a broad range of species and, and organisms and i think that's certainly a positive thing um and, and it's part of this understanding of all these interactions where you realize again like i said at the very beginning these critters uh, or plants are not living in a silo so in order to protect one you're gonna have to protect them all um and i believe that concept is actually called a not to some flagstone or um I just saw it and I can't remember, but there's a couple of other terms. There's like um, an umbrella species, I think might be one of them, where that's the species that they're going to use for conservation purposes, but it helps them protect a whole ecosystem because that species is there. Um, but it's also important for other ways. I always, I always try to find a money angle on some of these questions because I have uh, friends who will talk about this. something like, so what? what you know, how does this affect me? How does this affect my pocket? Um, the food we eat, 75% of the world's crops depend on pollinators. That's a lot of symbiotic relationships that are really, 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 really important. Okay. And there's uh, 235 to $577 billion in annual global food production. That is a direct result of pollination. That is free services from nature. Um, and, and I mentioned earlier, I was going to come back to it. And again, I don't. The nitrogen process uh, of all the the elemental cycles that you can learn like carbon and oxygen and water to me the nitrogen one has always been the hardest to understand um so i'm going to try to make it quick because i, I want to make a point about this and, and why it's so important here's lightning when lightning strikes it can actually fix fix meaning take atmospheric nitrogen and make it uh, turn it into a, a form of nitrogen like nitrates nitrates excuse me like nitrates which is able to be used by uh, biological organisms. But the atmospheric nitrogen is up there, this N2, we can't use it. So it's got to be fixed. So it can be fixed by lightning. Uh, obviously, that's not something you can depend on. Uh, there are several kinds of bacteria that are that work in this whole cycle that can fix bacteria. Uh, I talked about the nodules in the alder, very similar to the nodules here in this, in this legume. Um, so that's really, really important. 
if you want to produce food on a mass level, there um, and you can take this process or these processes and manufacture or, or make a, a, an artificial way to boost this nitrogen production, um, then you have a way to to obviously make a uh, you know, food more, um, make nitrogen more important and, and help boost crop production. Um, there was there was numbers. I wish I'd written this down. I wrote the other ones down. I'll show you in the next slide. But there was something like the amount of arable land we would have to use now to feed the world versus maybe a century ago um, is, I, I think, you know, four or five times higher than what we're actually using. Uh, and part of that is because we're able to process this nitrogen artificially using something called the Haber Bosch, Haber Bosch or just Haber process. Um, you can look at all this if you really want. Um, I couldn't tell you what a lot of this means, but if you remember that picture I showed you earlier, where it's just a little clump of nodules on the root of a plant, this should, I would think to you, look a whole lot bigger and a lot more involved than just a little clump of nodules uh, on the root of a plant. Um, but this is uh, the Haber process. It is, um, if you look at the bottom there, three to five percent of the world's natural gas production is used in the Haber process to fix nitrogen. Uh, and that's one to two percent of our world's energy supply. Um, but it's very successful. Uh, Fifty percent of nitrogen found in human tissues is direct is a direct result of this Haber process. The downside is um, this has significantly altered this nitrogen cycle. Um, and I didn't want to over diagram it, so I didn't throw another one in, but there's a very different looking diagram uh, when it shows uh, anthropogenic nitrogen fixation, the nitrogen fixation that we are doing and how that uh, affects um, ecosystem and how that affects um, the environment all around the world. And it's I like to say it's a positive, but it's not entirely positive. Obviously, uh, you're feeding a lot more people and using a lot less a uh, lot less arable land than when we need to. Um, but there are other environmental tolls and certainly some of them is nitrogen loading. Um, you know, the three main things you need to, to grow plants that you find in fertilizer is potassium, uh, potassium, phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, and you get a lot of nitrogen loading, which really um, takes nitrogen, which is um, in the history of our Earth been very difficult to to get unless of course obviously you're one of these plants that are fixing the nitrogen or you're really around a lot of uh, lightning strikes. Um, it's been essentially a limiting factor because if you only got so much nitrogen, you can only do so much growth. Um, and we're taking that obviously out of the equation by producing this nitrogen on our own. Um, but again, it does have consequences for um, the the global environment. Um, but this to me, this is the so what. If you want to protect a species, if you want to protect um, a lot of these natural processes which we benefit from, you've got to understand these interactions and these relations, uh, and especially when we depend on so much food. So I started with a lichen. I want to end with a lichen. Uh, this is a wolf lichen from uh, out in Washington state. Um, uh, I want to thank you guys for being here. Uh, done a couple minutes early. I'm going to come get my face back on the screen here. Um, this would be a, a time if anybody has any questions. I don't know. Uh, if anybody's raising their hand, if there was a bunch of questions waiting for me, but I'm ready for any questions anybody has. So no additional questions in the chat. A few okay. thank yous and super interesting and <laughs> folks definitely have enjoyed it. So that's great. OK, um, well, I'm going to hang out for a few minutes because uh, you know I, I did list this from seven to eight. If anybody has a question, um, you know, please let me know. Uh, or please feel free to unmute and chime in. Uh, if 17 of you do at the same time, then we might have to take some turns. Um, uh, but otherwise, thank you for coming. Like I said, I've got one uh, in three more weeks. And um, I know Maddie and I have been uh, uh, setting up programs throughout the summer, so there'll be a, a lot more stuff. If you're not a friend with us, on, if you're not, if you haven't liked us on Facebook, please feel free to, because a lot of our, our stuff is definitely getting put up there. Our, our um, both videos and photos that we're posting, but also programs and upcoming events. So please feel free to check that out. And again, you can email me if you have any questions as well, uh, or if you want to know more about upcoming events, you should all have my email, hopefully, because uh, I emailed you to come here tonight. Okay. Any questions? Hey, Ken, it's Betty. Hey, Betty, how are you? I'm excellent. How are you? 
I'm living the dream. I want to know uh, not about this particular lecture, but I'd like to be introduced to the new person. Oh, Maddie, um, I don't know if, Maddie, I think if you talk, you'll pop back up on everybody's screen. Yep, I'm here. Let me just see, give the camera a second. There we go. Hey, Maddie. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, see you. So uh, I just wanted to see you again uh, because we don't get to actually come to the Nature Center and see people face to face anymore. So it's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Hey, Betty, is it just you? Is Eggie still uh, traveling? Eggie's in Lexington, Kentucky right now. They're trying to find a place to eat. Uh, looks like <laughs> it's going to be Cracker Barrel. Gotcha. OK, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anybody else got any questions? It doesn't look like it. No questions in the chat. Well, I, I, I'm surprised I did that good a job. I, I hope everybody had a, any questions. Uh, again, I'll be here for a couple minutes. If anybody just wants to say hi, just wants to say hi. Uh, but thanks for coming. And I will email everybody. Um, with a link to the video um, once I get it and, and I'm able to post it up on uh, up on our YouTube channel. It'll, po it'll pop up on Facebook as well. Uh, so thanks for spending your uh, the Friday night with Maddie and I. appreciate um, everybody being here and uh, and thank you. It's a long way of saying thank you. Bye. Hi. Hey. Hi, Anna. Oh, I got the family on there. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm, well, I thought for sure there'd be more questions. All right, folks, it's, uh, it's 7.58. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and uh, realize it. Um, still recording here. And then, um, yeah, I guess that'll be it. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Have a great one. We'll see you some more. Uh, Maddie, when's your next program? My next program is at the end of June, so we'll be okay. doing one on pollinators. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Very good. we got a couple more coming up at the end of June, so hopefully we'll see all of you there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the meeting. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate your time. Have a good night, Maddie. Good night, Ken. Good night, everyone. Great job. Good night.